Thank you. We really do appreciate all the hard work that you guys do out in the field because you really do help people a lot during severe weather, and uh, it's critical that uh, that be done. Uh, our weather technologies that we've developed over the years are designed to help you do your job, and we hope that uh, some of you do take advantage of that. Just out, out of curiosity, how many of you have or do use, uh, say, the mobile threat net product we have with the XM satellite delivery? Okay, quite a number of you. Thank you very much. Well, tonight we're going to give one of those away, but first we're going to give away a... Um, a uh, <clears throat> one year subscription to our newest web-based Baron ThreatNet product. It's called Baron ThreatNet and um, it's also going to be um, given away tomorrow on the live stream so they'll get one, the people that have been watching the live stream and uh, you'll get one, one of you lucky people will get one here then we're going to give away a mobile ThreatNet. So um, <clears throat> if you um, if you would like a, a special two-month free trial of that new product, you can see me at the booth and I'll give you a little card. Some of you have already done that, and you can try that anytime you want to. And uh, I'm, I'm automatically giving you about $100 value, each one of you, for that because the subscription is $49 a month. So you get two months free if you want to try that out. And uh, thank you very much for that. And then finally... Um, <laughs> Finally, I'd just like to show you a short, like two minute video about what that new product is about so you'll get a feel for it if it's ready. Baron ThreatNet is your solution for fast, reliable, and precise. Baron ThreatNet is your solution for fast, reliable, and precise weather information. From any desktop or tablet, ThreatNet gives you instant access to professional-grade weather data and easy-to-use tools to help your organization make informed decisions to keep people and assets safe. Precision is at the core of ThreatNet. High-resolution data and intelligent, intuitive tools give you instant access to hyper-local information at the county, city, or street level. View the location and intensity of rainfall with live, local radar see exactly where lightning strikes are occurring. Prepare for how weather will affect your area with proven forecast data. And track storms with unparalleled precision. With the exclusive and impactful data products in ThreatNet, your organization can confidently put an effective weather preparedness plan into action. All this power is packed into a single, intuitive, and accessible product designed to be a one-stop resource for fast and actionable weather intelligence. From any computer or tablet, log into ThreatNet to quickly get the critical information you need. Dedicated to enhancing public safety, ThreatNet from Barron is your tool for fast and reliable weather intelligence when it matters most. Barron. Critical Weather Intelligence. All right, so that's a little taste of what it is. Uh, so feel free to try it out, or hopefully you'll win one here tonight. Um, who, where's, which one of these piles are we drawing from, uh, Roger? Of tickets here. Hmm. What? Red bucket. Red bucket. Okay. Now, so no, nobody thinks I've rigged this or something. I'm going to ask somebody else to pick this. All right, come on up here. You pick the number. This is for a one-year subscription to Baron ThreatNet, valued at about $529. All righty, thank you very much. And that number is 409916. We got somebody here with that? Is that you? Huh? Is, okay, great. All right, super. 
see what your ticket is right there? Yes, yeah, super. All right, excellent. Well, let me get with you in a minute, and I'll get some information from you for that, okay? Good. Congratulations. What's your name? Huh? Taylor? Okay, Taylor. Thank you for winning that. <laughs> okay. Now, um, we'll do the um, free subscription for the people watching on live streaming um, tomorrow. Um, we'll announce that on the online product. And now it's time to uh, do a drawing for the mobile threat net. All right. Let me just give a quick introduction to that. Um, let you know, in 2003, uh, our company, Barron, partnered with XM Satellite Radio to bring mobile high-speed satellite delivered weather data to aviation, marine, and ground subscribers uh, throughout the country. Today, we continue to be the exclusive provider of mobile satellite weather via the powerful XM radio signal. When data via Wi-Fi or cellular is not available, which I'm sure you've all experienced, or is too slow to be reliable, uh, many chasers, public safety officials, and others rely on our systems uh, continuously. See them, uh, and it helps see them through the severe weather events they're covering. So tonight, one lucky chaser is going to win a complete mobile threat net system valued at $1,154. And if you don't win tonight, um, you can receive the special exclusive ChaserCon discount uh, if you want to purchase one uh, of these systems for your own use. So just see me at the booth. I'll be here for a little while after the banquet and the break before the videos, and then I'll be here tomorrow as well. All right, so let's do the drawing for the mobile threat net. Uh, come on back up here. You did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we ready? It is four one zero zero six seven. All right. Come on up here, if you will, please. The man way back in the back there. Well, Joe, well, you, know. you have one, don't you? No, I have two. <laughs> Joe bought one a year or so ago from me, and now he's got another one. How about that? <laughs> well, thank you, Joe. Let me, uh, I'll get some information from you a little bit later. Okay, uh, and I'll give you the system here. I'll bring it back to you. Thank you, folks, for coming out. We appreciate it, and um, I'll turn it back over to Roger. All right, thanks a lot, Cliff. Yeah, the mobile threat net is a great system. I've had, we had the first generation and the second generation, and well, I tell you what, when you can't get internet somewhere, you know, the mobile threat net is awesome to, to be able to use. Actually, it's awesome to be able to use anytime. Okay. Well, it's that time of the night where uh, the, we introduce our keynote speaker. And I tell you what, when, when we decided to, to bring the, the uh, ChaserCon down to Oklahoma, to uh, Norman, the, the uh, severe weather capital of the world, uh, we, we, we talked about who on earth would we love to have as a keynote speaker. There are so many wonderful uh, potential candidates down here in Oklahoma. And I, I, I don't know about you all, but uh, there's, the, our, our keynote speaker is a, a gentleman who I've been a, a huge fan of for many years, and I'm sure many of you are as well. And uh, it's just a, an extreme pleasure to, to welcome and to introduce Mr. Oklahoma Weather, Gary England. You know, um, y'all heard that song Willie Nelson sings on the road again? 
I always think all you storm chasers when that comes on, because those of you that hadn't heard it, you need to listen to it. It's talking about because I know you guys want to bust out and get out there on the road, and I call it making music with your friends, and that's what the whole song says: get get on the road on the road again, making music with my friends. So it's it'll soon be that time of year. As far as keynote speaker, this is probably not your keynote talk. I don't have any special mission tonight. I don't have any really wise advice. I don't have any. Uh, I. Yeah, I'm just going to get up here and talk, tell you a little bit about myself, about some of the people I've worked with and some of the people who are in this room, and they'll probably regret they came tonight. <laughs> no, I'll be nice. You know, I'm Western Oklahoma, and I've talked to people tonight in Mississippi and Washington State all around. I'm out there in Western Oklahoma. Of course, I was, I was born and raised out there a long time ago. But I remember really when I was in Enid, Oklahoma, and my daddy, I, I began to hear him talk about he was concerned about my future, and he was concerned I was ever going to ma- amount to anything, and he made it pretty plain. Now, did he have a, a was he on, right on target with that? Probably so, because there at the, in Enid, I remember I knocked 53 windows out of the Lincoln Elementary School. I set the landlord's garage on fire. <laughs> it's all in the same time frame, and then also they had to talk me down off a two-story house with my homemade parachute on my back. And that's just a little bit of it, and that was just the first grade. (laughs) So Daddy had a right to be concerned, and God, we made it through the next 11 years, and I don't know how that happened. I was 17 years old, and I was a senior in high school, and any of you guys are almost as old as me, you remember all the movies about the Navy, you know, and Victory at Sea. You saw how they helped win World War II. Great stuff, great stuff. And I'm out there in Sealing, Oklahoma, man. I like that a lot. And then also in every movie I saw, and it always seemed to have the Navy in it, and there'd be a Navy guy walking down the street in San Francisco with a girl on each arm. It didn't take me long to figure out it doesn't work that way. But, but that was for me, man. I was excited about that. And I got my mama to sign the pi- papers, and I joined the Navy. And, and uh, after a little while, they sent me to, to Lake Hurst, New Jersey, to the Navy Weather School. And my last duty station, they didn't send me in very good places. Then my last duty station was a small island in the Pacific. 5,000 sailors and Marines. Probably about 50 girls on the island. It was a long year, man. <laughs> there are any Marines in the office? In, in, this, in the hall tonight, any Marines here? You know what I find out about Marines? When they don't have a war to fight, they practice on sailors. It was a long, long, long year. Well, yeah, I, I finished up out there. It was on Midway Island. And I got, I got an early out of service, go to college, went out to Southwestern State. Now, you, you picture this. You're me. You've been on this island for the last year. It's a mile and a half long, half a mile wide. All right. I get out to Southwestern, and all that was on my mind was beer and girls. Just beer and girls. That's all I could think about. And so uh, I didn't study very much. But I was standing in the street one day making floats for the homecoming parade, and I saw this little redhead walk out of this building right over here. And she walked out, and, walked, and she could have gone any place. She walked right between the two cars where I was standing with my date. Hey, you're from Sealing, Oklahoma. You've been on an island for a year. You know, what do you do? What would you do, guys? You know, I did. Because my date was, you know, okay, girl. It wasn't real friendly. This little redhead walked by, and I just reached out and grabbed her and kissed her. And my date slapped me, and I kissed this redhead again, and that's how I met my wife, Mary. <laughs> oh, God. Thank heaven for her, I'd never amounted to anything. But, uh, yeah, she was pretty much of a prude. She was from Hobart, Oklahoma, strict Baptist brother, you know. And so, I, you know, I didn't realize it then. You guys put not realize it. When you start going with a girl or, or start getting engaged or whatever it is and married, they put you in a retraining program. You all know that? I was in it 30 years before I figured it out. <laughs> but uh, I, I lived in a, in a basement apartment with a guy named Harry Gordon. Harry, big old tall kid, a Golden Gloves boxer, and, and ever, ever, almost ever. And I said, it seemed like we'd go down close to the girl's dorm. And we go across the street to this house. I had a ladder behind it. And we go get that ladder and we put it up against the wall at the girl's dorm. And I'd crawl up on that and beat on Mary's window. She would never come to the window. You know, it became kind of a deal. She'd have her little friends come up there and they'd try to shoo me away. 
And one night, Harry and I couldn't find the ladder. You guys put yourself in this position. Couldn't find it. So what do you do? Harry says, I'll be your ladder. So we go over there, and I take my shoes off, and I get on Harry's shoulders. Harry stands up, and I can just get my elbows up on that ledge so I can peck a little bit like that, and I'm standing on my tiptoes and on Harry's shoulders. And about that time, the campus police came around the corner. <laughs> they hit us with a spotlight. I'll never forget this as long as I live. My best friend, Harry Gordon, ran out from under me. <laughs> God, I left there right after that, about two weeks later, after visiting with the dean. And <laughs> but, you know, it was wild and crazy and all that stuff. Well, I left there, and Mary and I got married. Went down to OU and... and uh, Got a degree finally in math and meteorology. And I got out of college, and I was excited. You know, I wanted to be a TV weather guy. I've been, I wanted to be a TV weather guy ever since I saw Harry Volkman years ago. He was my idol. And I got out of school. Nobody would hire me. There were, I couldn't get a job. When I talk to kids about jobs, they come and ask me. I show them all my rejection letters. I guess they send rejection emails now. But I, I couldn't find a job. So to make a long story short, Finally ended up down in New Orleans for a company called A.H. Glenn and Associates. And he was the world's top oceanographer. And I didn't even really know that until later. But uh, he was uh, apparently the best, best, best there was. And it was a, the greatest education I ever got. Is a real life, a real life Ph.D. is what it was. But he was a rough sucker. He was bright and brilliant, but he was kind of mean when he, we worked six days a week. And he believed if you let one person off on a holiday, you had to let everyone off. So you know what he did? Everyone worked a part of every holiday. Now think about that. So I'm in that environment with him. I have to tell you one story about him. We'd done some work on South Pass 61 offshore. Some of you in the offshore people know about that. Is Shell's, Shell owned the lease. It was going to be the world's deepest offshore platform at that time. And I think it was only like 300 feet. And we did the... The civil engineering design work on that thing and the forecasting, towing it out. They dumped it out. They rammed it however they made it stand up and put all those rigs on it. And Hurricane Camille came to town. <laughs> and uh, next morning, Shell flew out there. The guys did, looked at that area in a helicopter, and it was gone, man. It was gone. It had been such a big deal. And it caused quite a commotion because the Japanese were involved, and I, as I recall, and a bunch of other companies. They all came out the office. And Glenn's tall, distinguished, very brilliant guy, always wore his little half glasses. And it was very noisy in this conference room because these guys were really upset. They didn't know what they were going to do. And so I watched him, and these guys ran and raided. Finally, he went, gentlemen, gentlemen, this was not a 100-year storm. And they all look up. He said it was a 1,000-year storm. He didn't know. They all went, oh. And he just walked out, and he had that ability. It was amazing to watch that guy work. And I got out of there pretty fast. I got me one of those trucks, says Adventure Moving, came back to Oklahoma because I wanted to be where the storms were. And I came back, didn't have a job. I tried to get a job. They wouldn't hire me as a, a typewriter salesman. If you young kids won't remember typewriters, but, you know, <laughs> they wouldn't hire me for anything. But I was driving down West Main in Oklahoma City one day, and there's a house there, and there's KTOK radio, and I saw they were installing a small radar antenna on it. So I went in there, and I talked to Mr. Jones, the general manager, and he said, uh, basically, I won't tell you exactly what he said, but he said that uh, he didn't need me. And uh, but I used to go down there. It, was, it seemed like it was wintertime by then, and, and it was, it was kind of cold. And I'd go down there and drink coffee at their place because we didn't have any coffee at home in one morning because I knew. When that storm came up, they were going to need me to run that radar. And they did. They got a bit nice little, it was, it was an AVQ-10, five-degree beam width, so you couldn't tell the difference between a table and an, and an aircraft carrier. Yeah. <laughs> Just, but, so they, they, they said, you have any ra radar experience? I said, yes, sir. I had looked at a radar when I was on Midway. I considered the experience. Thank God they didn't ask me anything else because I had none. But uh, so they sent me up in the office, gave me the office there in the attic, and uh, his little tiny desk, a little light bulb hanging down, little, and the, the scope was just about like that, a little bigger, and uh, the little light, as I mentioned, the telephone, and I started doing radio reports, and, and I was pretty stiff, and one of the guys took me in there in the studio and said, we're going to teach you to laugh and have fun on the air, and he did, 
He was a great guy. And uh, we created the 805-pound Thunder Lizard, a fictitious character that chased Coors beer trucks, trucks down I-40 and Highway 66. And, and I do this on the radio, and people got to believe in it, man. And I'd say, just cross mile marker 114 or whatever it was. And, and those days, you'd have stops. People would stop and call in. I just saw it cross the road. <laughs> you'd be surprised how many people really saw that thunder lizard. We did some crazy stuff. One July, not a cloud in the sky, and it had to be 100 degrees. I thought, I got to liven up this audience. So I got my tornado beeps out. Remember, not a cloud out of. Drive time, 5 p.m., and I ran the beep, 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 and it caused quite a commotion. Now, nowadays, you'd go to jail for that. <laughs> but people went to work and said, you got to listen to that guy over on, on KTOK. He's crazy. And so we did some of that, but I'd always wanted to be on television. And I, um, no, I missed nobody to hire me. So I was up there in my attic office, and one day the phone rang. And this guy says, listen, my name is Jack Galeer. I'm the general manager of Channel 9. I'd like to talk to you. I said, okay, because it's been my lifetime dream since I've been in the seventh grade. I wanted to be on television. I wanted to be a television meteorologist. And, you know, I, in those days, I was pretty much truffle off. It's moving along here, blah, blah, blah. Was, you know, wasn't, that was, wasn't very personable. But uh, anyway, Jack Galeer said, we, we've seen you. We'd like to talk to you. And so I went out there, and I did an audition. And, God, they hired me. Can you believe that? They hired me. I thought, my gosh, did I finally get to do it? And uh, before I went to do that, that, that audition, I didn't have a suit. So Mary and I drove down to Hobart, Oklahoma. That's her hometown. Anybody you guys been through Hobart chasing storms? Pretty scary out there, isn't it? <laughs> but, <coughs> so uh, we did, went down and went to Levine's department store. So you may know of Levine's. And, and I bought me. A maroon jacket and light blue pants and a multicolored shirt and a multicolored tie. Baby, I was styling. <laughs> Hair was about down to here by now. And so did the, did the tape. They hired me. And it's pretty darn exciting. You know, I, I didn't realize because that was a long time ago. That was August 16, 1962. So Jack Dallaire said, Gary, you need to get involved in the community. You know, you need to get out and do things with the people in the community. Well, a lot of things happened. One thing they called up from uh, Hint Hinton, Oklahoma, and said, listen, we'd like for you to be in the Hinton Rodeo. I said, what do you want me to do? They said, we'd like for you to ride a horse in the parade. You ever seen, you guys know Hinton's Main Street. It's only about a block long. And they said, we'd like for you to ride a horse in, this, in, the, in the parade, and you'll be there. The little queen will be right beside you and her horse. And so... I go down there that day, I said, okay, I said, I said, listen, I've been bitten by a horse, and I've been kicked by a horse, I don't, you know, I want a good horse, okay, and I drive up, and there in the corral was, you guys remember the movie Cat Blue, yeah. there were little horses over there, it looked like it was inebriated, it was leaning against the fence, like this, <laughs> sway back, I said, baby, this is the horse for me, <laughs> so uh, I was pretty excited about that, got on that horse, and he just kind of, mm. that's the way we walked to town, it was great. And we get all lined up, the queen's right here, the people are behind us, the band starts up, everybody starts to move, my horse refuses to move. Then in about, uh, it seemed like 15 seconds, I'm sure it was like maybe 10 or whatever, my, there, everybody's moving, my horse bolts forward, runs down there like, you're the gal on the horse. My horse jams into her, jams her and the horse up against the back of a car, and everybody, I'm going, gee, man. Christmas, and we just all line up, and it, we get all line up, music starts again, we start, we start, same thing happens, and anyway, we finally finished the parade, and I got back there, and I told that old boy, give me that horse, I said, what is wrong with that horse? He said, well, tell me what that horse did, and I told him, he said, oh, there's nothing wrong with that horse, that's a rodeo pickup horse, you know what that is, that's a horse that runs out and takes the riders off the bronc, he was just doing his job. Scared the living daylights out of me. <laughs> he called me up one time from, um, I was downtown Oklahoma City, and uh, they, they said, we'd like for you to ride the parade. So what did I say? I said, what do you want me to do? He said, ride an elephant. By then I'm thinking, well, I rode a bull. You know, I've done all these things. I've been on big horses and all that stuff. So I said, I can do, I can do an elephant. So we go down there and 
And uh, I, there's 20 elephants, 19 of them have people on them because I'm always late. And I get down there, and, and I notice everybody has on their Levi's and their blue jeans. And I'm in, I was styling, I was in my double knit pants. Any of you here remember double knit pants? Anything goes through them. They're just real loosely woven. So they tossed me up on top of that elephant, and in my double knit pants, I don't know if you know it, up there where you ride with an elephant, the elephant hair is about that long. I rode two miles that day with elephant hair in my underwear. <laughs> it was a long trip. <laughs> They called up Purcell, Oklahoma one time and said, listen, we're going to have a rodeo. Would you like to be in the rodeo? Not real careful by then. What's the deal? I'd like for you to ride a bull. Uh -uh. I said, no, 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 no. The guy said, wait, wait. He said, we have a trained bull. And this is where I made my mistake. I said, oh, oh, how's that work? He said, get the bull and shoot. You get on him, open the gate, and he walks out. You blow a whistle and he bucks, and you blow a whistle and he stops bucking. I said, you got a deal. Talked myself into a corner for 60 days. I talked about the Purcell Rodeo. I said, come to the rodeo, and we're going to ride a bull and all this stuff because I had to train bull. About a week or so before, before the rodeo, I get a book in the mail, a little paperback book, and I open it up. It's on bull riding. And I remember thinking, why would I need a book on bull riding if I have a trained bull? It still didn't dawn on me. So I show up down there, and I got on my bell-bottom Levi's. This is a long time ago. I didn't have real cowboy boots. I had blue patent leather boots from Napoleon Nash, you know, a striped shirt, big white hat, and uh, got down there, and they said, let's go look at your bull. And we walk over there, and boy, he knew he had a newbie. He knew I was brand new. That sucker started kicking and jumping and romping around in there. So later, when it came rodeo time, they get him in the chute. By then, I was a little bit concerned. They gave him a shoot, and I go over, and he sees me again, and God, he's just thrashing around in there. And, uh, and, I, and I talk to myself, I had to get on the bull. And, you know, you get up there, and you stand over them, and their, their back is just solid muscle. And I sat down, and every time you try to sit down, you, you, could, you could feel his muscles just ripple along your legs. And I'm going, God. And, and every time I get, where I get a hold of the rope, he'd try to, look, he'd try to hook my left leg with his left horn. And that concerned me quite a bit. And he had a matching horn on the other side. <laughs> and so, you know, I didn't know they tie you down. They really actually tie you down. And I'm basically tied there. And you, you've seen those cowboys? Their head automatically shakes. And that's when they turn you loose. And we traveled, you know, quite a ways, very shortly. And I went up there, landed on my head. And I came down. Climbed the fence and went home. So I'm much more careful after all of that. So in my television business, a lot of it, a lot of it was that. Well, there's somebody here I have to recognize before I go on. That's Gary Lezak. Mr. Lezak. Gary, baby. And Gary, Gary came to me as a child. I don't know how many years ago. How, how old were you? 20, 23. Uh, Gary uh, graduated from OU. He's an intern with me for a long time. Worked with me a long time. And uh, I found a tape of you, and I, I just couldn't run it tonight. I can't do that to you. But he came, and he's an intern, but he wanted to be on the air. And, and Gary's changed a little bit in that, you know, he used to, when he did the first few tapes, he always looked a little off the side, and he, and, and, and he had the ability to raise an eyebrow clear up to here. <laughs> now, it was really an odd presentation. And I showed my wife that tape. Gary's in Kansas City now. What station is it? KSHB. Okay. Uh, so, Gary, my t I showed that tape to my wife. She said, this is never going to work. <laughs> but, I, you know, there was something about him. Even There was that charisma. And I always figured he'd take over the Johnny Carson show. He's a great guy, great meteorologist, and I do believe in your program. But, uh, anyway, Gary was with me quite a while. And I've had a lot of people with me a lot of while around the country. Now, a few other ones are in here who have worked with me a bit. And that's, uh, is that Bob, is Bobby around here? Bobby Payne, he's not here. Okay. Alan Brosey. Alan, wave your hand. Where are you, Alan? There's Alan back there. Alan called me up one time 20-some years ago, 15, 8, about 20, 20 years ago. Uh, retired Oklahoma City policeman. Knew a lot about the weather, been out in the weather. He called me up and he said, I'd like to uh, chase for you. 
And he came out, and we talked some, and we finally agreed. And he's been a great chaser, a great guy. But we had him. Anybody in here ever been to Visay, Oklahoma? We had him out there on one dark night, one spring night. And you know, and out there near Visay and Sharon, when it's dark, it's dark, man. Big, big mesocyclone, big tornadic thunderstorm out to the west. Communication, we're not all, all that good. But he's out there with some other chasers of ours. And here, I'm on the air, you know, blah, 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 you know, this is the here, this is the, but I can hear the radio over there, and, and I thought that maybe Alan was, you know, wanted some attention. So I went live with him on the air, and I said, Alan, because by that time I looked at the radio, and I said, you need to get out of there. That tornado's coming directly towards you. And I won't tell you exactly what he said, but I do recall Alan shouting, I'm already in the tornado! <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> he said a lot of other things. <laughs> the what? Oh yeah, it's gonna be a great TV shot. <laughs> the audio turned out better than the, than the video. Let me tell you. <laughs> James Menzies is in here. James has worked with us. I don't know if James is still around or not. He's from Great Britain, and he moved here to chase storms, he chased, and he moved to the United States to, to work with me as a storm chaser. So he shows up at the television station. And I've told my boss, this guy is moving from Great Britain here to work with us. We're excited. I don't know how many of you know James. He, you know, yeah. Well, he does walk to a different drummer, right? He's a great guy, just a little different. He shows up first time at the station, he has yellow and green hair. <laughs> Remember boss looking at me, yeah, right. But uh, we've, had, we've had great times together. Who else is here? Uh, uh, Marty Logan's here. Where's Marty? Marty, you right there too? Marty's northwestern Oklahoma. Woodward one time I... I was desperate for storm chasers. I advertised a newspaper, and a fireman replied, and that was Marty. And Marty is just like this, stable, you know, straight guy, religious guy, just like this. And he just, reporting on it, it's always been good. It's always, you know, no matter what's big, little, indifferent, it's always the same deal. Well, early on, I about lost him because we talked, and, uh, and he said, yeah, he'd work for us. And then the first time he called after that conversation, you know, I, I clown around some nowadays, and I answered the phone. And keep in mind, Marty's real straight. I answered the phone, and I said, Barnes and Noble, would you like to be Barnes or Nobled? <laughs> Dead silence on the other end of the phone. <laughs> and as I recall, I think he clicked it off and called me back later. Uh, great times there, great storms. And Mark Hill, Mark, baby, where is Mark right here? Mark, Mark and I go back how many years? Well, quite a... Over 20, probably. Well, Mark, great chaser, great guy. We've had a lot of exciting times. But he didn't always have the best vehicle. And he always had lots of problems with that car. Well, one of my TV meteorologists had a, had a brother on the East Coast that wanted to come and chase tornadoes. And he comes in. He's kind of a snooty, smart little butt guy, you know. All slicked up, dooted up, and he went to chase tornadoes. So I lined him up with a night chase with Mark in western Oklahoma. <laughs> that boy needed to be introduced to the real world, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and kind of as the story goes, Mark and this uh, slick guy they were headed west on I-40. They're getting closer and closer to the storm. The tornado is a, it's a rotating thunderstorm. And lightning flash, Mark sees a tornado. It's on I-40 East in front of him. And Mark was always quick to make decisions. Bang. Cut that car to the left. Went down in that ditch between the two parts of the highway there. Bam. Slammed the gas on. Bam. Bam. Two tires go out. And he thumps to stop on the right, head, heading east on I-40. Forcing the tornado chains. We never saw that kid again, did we, after you brought him back? He never, ever said a word. He just went home. He talked to his brother. He didn't talk to us anymore. <laughs> Another time. Can somebody tell me what time it is? My clock doesn't work. Okay. 
All righty. One time a guy called up and he said, I'm a preacher at this certain church here in Oklahoma City area, and a great guy. And he said, I want to chase storms. Great personality. He said, okay. And he chased a few storms. Did okay. Got some video. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, one day we had a big storm day coming up. You know how those are. Everybody's trying to get ready to do it. You got to get out there. Well, his car was broken down. So he went to a car dealer and asked him if he could test drive a vehicle. I had to deal with all this stuff. So we went out chasing. A couple days later, he was in East Texas, still chasing, still chasing tornadoes in that stolen car. And that's when the police put him in the county jail. <laughs> Golly. Oh, gosh. He never did chase for us anymore after that. It was great when the phone just we used to ring and right on the set and just pick it up and you, all kinds of calls. Got a call from the sheriff of Logan County, just north of Oklahoma City. And he said, Mr. England. I said, yes, sir. He said, one of your storm trackers just went by me and he was speeding. And the, and the sheriff told me he had been sitting at a railroad track, just the single, the two tracks, and the hump up above grade. And I said, I said, well, how fast was he going? And the sheriff said, I don't know. I said, well, did you chase him? He said, no. I said, why didn't you chase him? He said, well, number one, he was going too fast. And here's the quote. He said, and, and the other reason is because he was in the air when he went by me. <laughs> Some of you here have done that, I know. <laughs> hey, mind, all these calls come in. I had to deal with them. It's like having a huge family of wild kids, it's kind of like. A lady called me one time, she was on Interstate 40 East, east of Midwest City, and storms over that way, and she said that uh, she had observed a News 9 storm tracker roaring down that road uh, with empty beer cans blowing up out of the rear of the truck. I tried to act like I was incensed, and I said, well, ma'am, what makes you think is one of our storm chasers? She said, well, his name was on the side of the truck. <laughs> There's some good and bad things about that. Now, one I like to never got out of, a lady called me up. She said, I want you to know one of your storm trackers is in a park right now smooching it up with some girl. I said, really? She said, yeah, they're really smooching it up. I don't know what all she said like that. But I said, well... I didn't know what to say, and I finally said, well, I, I can assure you, ma'am, that's either his wife or his girlfriend, whichever, and, and they are well known for showing their aff affection for each other, and that worked. Can you believe it? It makes you wonder what she was doing in the park, this lady. <laughs> but calls like that came in for years, and people ask me all the time, well, what's, uh, how close the tornado's been to, to uh, Channel 9? Well, the closest they ever came, what were we talking about? Was that 2003? Some of you guys ran it. Was it? Nighttime tornado. Mesocyclone developed in a thunderstorm near Hobart or Altus, and it had perfect super characteristic all the way and moved toward Oklahoma City for four hours. And, you know, you run out of things to say. But it got to southwest Oklahoma City, put a couple of tornadoes down, blew some things away, and, uh, and essentially it was coming right along uh, 63rd Street. And we were busy, man. And in those days, there was a lot of noise in there. All the radios were going. And that thing, we didn't think about it. It's coming directly toward us. And we'd blah, 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 this and blah, blah, that. And we had a live truck, Broadway Extension, 63rd point of Southwest. And this guy that drove a truck's funny, big old guy. And he always, his hat was always kind of off the side. And the storm was getting really close and it started to storm a little bit. And he said he looked over and he saw one of the storm chasers right beside us right beside him, and he was thinking, this is not good, this is not good, and then there was a big power flash, and, you know, the wind, the wind's coming around the backside of that thing, and it, it, it lit up the sky, I mean, the entire sky, some of you may remember that, and when that was happening, you see this guy, the engineer, running through the shot, it looked like it was in slow motion, 
he was, he was running. He, so he's trying to get out there about the time that, that the, storm, the storm chaser said, Gary, it's coming to the television station. Yeah, we, we think about that. We're so busy going, you take a tornado precaution, day of nine, we'll keep you advised, blah, 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 blah. We're doing all and I got the blah, blah, blah from you years ago. That stuff worked. And, and, and we just get all these warnings, all these things. This, this tornado is developing. And later, there was a, 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 a report later from a Dow, and a Dow sent out a message, which I didn't see. His tornado intensifying rapidly two miles east of, Interstate, of Broadway Extension on 63rd Street. And we're doing this. Our storm chaser says it's coming to the station. And I turned around. I said, get everybody out of this studio. Now, Jed Castle, some of you know Jed dove under a desk. His rear end sticking out. I said, Jed, I don't think this is going to do it, baby. <laughs> and what I discovered that night in that television station, there were no gentlemen. None at all. And I can sum it up by saying, because it was a stampede. And we didn't have a safe room. We had what we called a safer room. It was safer than the other rooms. <laughs> so, God, people were pouring out of there. They headed for that. And we had a, unfortunately, we had a couple of engineers there from a company, and they shot all this stuff on their own. Now, our folks didn't think to shoot it. He shot all this great footage. But as he went by the control room, he goes in there. We had a female producer and a male producer. And I just said, get everybody out of the studio. And the male producer turns to the girl and said, Jim, you go on. I got it covered. And he big cowboy boots and, you know, big cowboy hat and all that stuff. Well, she told me about She told me the story. She said about five seconds later, she, he ran up her back in the, in the hallway trying, trying to get to the shelter, man. Just flat ran over. Uh, it, was, it was quite a night. And you could hear it, you know, especially with the tower there. It was really, really loud. Came directly over the station, still intensifying. Touched down, I don't know, half a mile, three-quarters of a mile northeast of us at around 150, 155 mile an hour, they estimated at that particular time. Uh, so it was an interesting night. We've had a few other close calls, but that was one of the better ones. Now, one of my favorite stories has to do with Alan Mitchell. How many of you know Alan? Alan worked with me how many years ago, you know? Well, you, was he there when you were there? Yeah. Alan, Alan, when he came to me, he came in the back door one day. I'd like, I'd like to work for you. And Alan, good-looking guy, long silver hair, okay? Looking good, baby, long silver hair, you know? And he was ex-Air Force. He was in the Air Force right then. Always in a suit, always look good, always smell good. Yes, sir, no, sir, kind of guy, man. We really had a system, you know, Tornado 270, uh, 272 at 40 miles, boom, 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 boom plot, do all of uh, great stuff. And uh, spring of 86, tornado or thunderstorm was developing southwest of Oklahoma City. We're getting reports from wall clouds, uh, funnel clouds, you know, small hail, then baseball size hail, and then funnel clouds reported. You know how it goes. And uh, it was pretty wild, and we didn't have a lot of cameras outside then. And that was just southwest of the station. So I said, Alan, why don't you go out behind and look? Alan said, yes, sir. Alan went outside, and he came back, whatever time it was. And <laughs> his, the first thing I saw was his tie. It was blown over his shoulder. That long hair was all blown over the long, it was beautiful hair, all blown over the side. And he was looking at me, and he was going, you, 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 you. And he finally said, you better come and look at this. I went out the back door, and the entire sky was rotating. I went, oh, my God. And I had to go back in and do one of those. The tornado warning continues for Oklahoma County. All, all residents continue to tornado precautions. Stay at News 9. We'll keep you advised. But I had a problem. My voice was up like this. And I was afraid I was going to go, you're all going to die. You're going to die. God, it was, it was crazy. So. Let me um, tell you one story. <coughs> it was a stormy, stormy night. After, it was afternoon, really, in northwestern Oklahoma. And really, we'd reached a point in storm coverage. We just threw everybody out the back door. This was years ago. Anybody could carry a camera. We didn't care if she was running the front door, if she was an engineer. or he's do, We put them in cars and gave them film cameras. problem those days, the film cameras, the film only lasts three minutes, and you'd have to change. I swear to heck, every time they got a tornado, the film would run out, or the battery would die. But anyway, we just throwing them out the door, throwing them out the door. And one day, it was real stormy just west of Woodward, ugly-looking stuff. 
In those days, before the cell phones and all that, they were supposed to call in. Now, you guys, you're all pretty independent. Storm chasers, by nature, are very independent. But we told our guys, okay, call in. They didn't call in. So I got on the air, and I was doing an update, and I said, by the way, you know, we have some missing storm chasers in northwest Oklahoma. <laughs> and, you know, we don't know where they are, but we know we got them out there. A few minutes, the phone rang, and it was a citizen from Woodward. <laughs> he was great. He said, Gary, those missing storm chasers are across the street from me in a flea market. <laughs> Is that great or not? Yeah. <laughs> we wonder why we didn't get Mets Tornado video in those days. <laughs> Let's see here. What else? Oh, quick story about Ranger 9, first Ranger 9 ever. I think the first big tornado was ever shot. Uh, it was 1981, I think. And smaller helicopter, there's a pilot, there's a photographer, and a reporter. Um, remind me to come back to this. The reporter, I think I want to heard if I tell us, he was in there, and he was kind of a wild man. And he uh, later was found at, the, at an intersection, you know, a few years later, had been drinking a little bit, and he'd passed out, and he had a 45 on the seat beside him. They arrested him. And you know what? He's now an attorney. <laughs> I think that's pretty funny. <laughs> he went on to become an attorney. Anyway, he was in, the, he was in that helicopter. He was a crazy man. But anyway, the, the pilot reports in. He said, I have a large tornado near Cordell, Oklahoma. I look at the radar, and there's nothing at Cordell. And really, for a few minutes, I thought the radar was broken. And he keeps giving a great report, great video. We're watching this stuff, and you know, we're all mesmerized. God, there's a tornado. And, he's, and I'm trying to figure out where it is. Phone rings again. And a guy is a farmer. He said, that tornado you boys are showing on television is uh, near my house north of Clinton, Oklahoma. So the pilot was lost. Next thing the pilot did was fly into the inflow, and he was almost sucked into the tornado. <laughs> and you never heard so much cussing and screaming and swearing coming, you know, from that helicopter, anything you ever heard in your life. Uh, it, was, it was quite a day. You know, they had no experience in dealing with it, and the, and the pilot didn't have any with that. Uh, <laughs> when GPS became popular for the public, it was an adjustment for all the storm chasers. Because they were used to driving out there and saying, yeah, we're going to take, you know, 180, and we're going to turn, we're going to do this. Well, we'd like, we'd tell them where to go, and just, we knew they didn't go there, you know. It's like you guys, you're pretty independent. So, uh, the GPS comes along, and we got it on all the vehicles, got it on the map there, and it went through a period there, we'd have to say, uh, okay, uh, take a left onto 270. You look down there, check that GPS, and you come back and say, burn your other left. Because they, it took a long time for them to, to adjust to the GPS. Well, what's it really like uh, working at a television station? We're going to run a little uh, DVD in this last few minutes. This is what it's really like a good part of the time. So maybe we can take a look at that. That's when the lights are off. Well, oh, okay, all right. I could have given you a blank DVD, I don't know. <laughs> Which is it going to be on both? Okay, we'll just wait. It's some good stuff. Is that Beano? <laughs> oh, Bill, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Run that volume up on the sucker, but keep my, ma my mic hot. I may have a few comments. Look at that bug. Can you get any more audio? I'm just saying, you got any bug spray in this place? Okay. Uh, can, we, can we run that from the start? 
Well. Frog. <laughs> normals of 70. We had a 92 this afternoon and a 92 on the normals. I mentioned and records for this. <laughs> you know, we gave bug spray for this place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You see that thing? <laughs> okay. At Gaiman, 70 at Ardmore, we have a little drog. We have a little frog. <laughs> Top of the six o'clock news here. Now in January, you're going to be able to get a little A camper started the blaze, this is how it happened, by lighting toilet paper on fire. The blaze ate up more than 4,100 acres last night, and it's nothing to laugh at, although you really wonder, you know, what was going on there. Crews have it about 30% contained this evening, though. <laughs> Can you go? <laughs> the guy tried to burn the evidence. At least he was big enough to admit it, I guess. Yeah. I've always wanted to do the currents, may I? Okay, let's, check let's do the currents, and I'm going to do it. <laughs> On the uh, allergies. Wars, <laughs> thunderstorms, what's left of them, moving on in. <laughs> on. I'm in love, and I'm all shook up from home. Watch your co-anchor. Well, we want to go ahead and go now to Mark Opgrant. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for choosing News 9 this morning. I'm Ed Murray. I'm Robin Marsh. Why did I say I'm Ed Murray? Because <laughs> you read my line. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's Wednesday, July 27th. Yeah. Chief. A mule train reenactment. Good. <laughs> I'm on. I can we'll have more for you coming up at 4 o'clock. And for the Metro. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, oh. Who is that? Oh. Looks like someone we all know and love. Ah. We all know and love. Ah. And that's, uh... Gary's light up. Gary's eyes light up as soon as he finds out it's... <laughs> as soon as he finds out it's, finds out it's front. Gary, I'm just going to give it to you. Would you do the weather? Okay, I'm just <laughs> totally lit up in here. Uh... I was like, it's mind over matter. It's mind over matter. But right now, my matter is freezing. <laughs> Dr. Bowman, I'm 38 and have a hernia about the size of an orange. I'm overweight. Is this dangerous and can I have it removed? Around the abdominal cavity. But for now, they haven't been successful at all. And a lot of people like the guy here, ow, I just got bit, are having to rent bees. Going to be traveling Dallas, 99, hot and you. Uh, uh, hello. What happened here? <laughs> that green building you see in the graphic right there is where Gary was Paul last night in this transmitter. Transmitter sends the pulse up the uh, radar tower up to the antenna where it, the antenna sends out a pencil width beam out towards the thunderstorm and out there it interrogates the thunderstorm, gets the data and then uh, goes back into the radar tower then back uh, into the while some spoke, folks spend a leisure day outside enjoying the nice weather others were actually inside working up a good sweat uh, I think that's <laughs> wouldn't they do this to me you know they're <laughs> it's supposed to be pictures of people doing aerobics working up a sweat yeah, not kissing working up aerobics. a sweat <laughs> look at the hot shot <laughs> what a beauty <laughs> that's India <laughs> Start the giggles all over again. How great. Okay. That's, good stuff. That's good stuff. Kelly? 95. Checking out a little bit of football, looks like. Wind southeast. Of... Who is that guy? Who is that? <laughs> Other temperatures. <laughs> Justin's at the salt farm. Hello, Justin. Justin doesn't know Can you where give he me is. a little volume, Ken? <laughs> okay, Justin. Oh, he looks good, doesn't he? He's setting a style. <laughs> so you get him out there more often. Uh, every item on the farm represents an ingredient to make pizza, including the toppings. And in case the uh, fresh air out there makes you hungry. If you have questions or concerns about the high gas prices, you're invited to air them at a public gas forum. 
The forum will be held Tuesday at 7 o'clock at Rose State College. <laughs> Maybe we should refer to that. <laughs> we'll call that a gas forum that is open to the public. <laughs> we'll see. That wraps it up, folks. <laughs> uh, it's been an honor for me to be here tonight, to be with you all, and I tell you, stay safe. You do a great job helping the, keep the public safe. Uh, what you do is very valuable. We use it all the time and to our advantage, and I do have to tell you, I, turn, I go to all the websites, I watch you guys, I listen, and you're, let me tell you, you're, you're storm chasers. I've watched you. You drive in circles, you drive in squares and rectangles. <laughs> you'll drive forward at 60, and you'll, then you'll drive backwards about the same speed. <laughs> in good weather and bad. But the thing is, somewhere along the line, that chase gene, that weather gene, was activated. And once you got it, you just can't help yourself, can you? Thank you all for everything you do. Good night. Gary England, everybody. Thank you very much, Gary. The average stroke of lightning is six to ten miles long. You are always in danger from approaching storms even with clear skies overhead. The earth receives more than eight million lightning strikes per day. This number is increasing with global warming. Any storm within eight miles can reach you with a lightning strike. Wall lines are moving storm fronts that can be hundreds of miles in length and move at speeds of 50 miles per hour. Tornadoes develop quickly and without warning in small areas of a squall line as it moves. for the storm. Uh, we'll start with our third place, go to second and first. Our third place goes to Dean and Leslie Burton. Yeah. Hope you all got a chance to go out and look at some of the vehicles out there. They were great. And our second place vehicle contest winner goes to Brian Grabiel. Where's Brian? <laughs> All right, congratulations, Brian. Thank you. 
All right, and our first place winner in the vehicle contest goes to Jay Robertson. Where's Jay at? All right, congratulations, Jay. All right, I'll tell you what, with that, we are going to take a break. And uh, you know what, what time do you want to start? Corey, you want to shoot at 9 or a little earlier? Or? 8.45, so if you want to do video night, come on back here at 8.45. We'll have a great time. Weather affects everyone, every home, every climate, every day. It's critical in every country, every industry. How you prepare and respond can be the difference in lives saved or lost, property protected or destroyed, and being ready for whatever comes next. You need a partner who can equip you with intelligent solutions to prepare for and protect against significant weather threats. Barron is the standard for critical weather intelligence. Through decades of work across the globe, Barron has led the way in every market, inventing and innovating weather solutions. Since inventing street-level storm tracking, we haven't stopped breaking new ground in weather data, radar hardware, real-time display capabilities, and hyper-local dissemination tools. Partners benefit from our effective, reliable solutions, tailored to their precise needs. This cohesive network of tools offers the flexibility to incorporate legacy assets. To identify hydrological threats, dual pole data provides the most powerful and accurate hydrometeor information available. Barron leads the way in dual pole data products with solutions that can pinpoint events like hail, flooding, and more. Our world-class radar systems have been proven in countries across the globe including the successful upgrade of the United States National Weather Service radar system to dual pole. A complete suite of display solutions and class-leading data products work together to effectively display and interpret live radar. Additionally, Barron forecast models provide the most precise model guidance and weather prediction. Digital solutions provide hyper-local dissemination of information send alerts to an exact area to notify people who are in the path of a threat. Barron defines the standard in significant weather solutions, turning meteorological data into actionable intelligence to save lives, to protect property, and to prepare for what's next. Barron is your partner for critical weather intelligence.
The average stroke of lightning is six to ten miles long. You are always in danger from approaching storms, even with clear skies overhead. The Earth receives more than eight million lightning strikes per day. This number is increasing with global warming. Any storm within eight miles can reach you with a lightning strike. Squall lines are moving storm fronts that can be hundreds of miles in length and move at speeds of 50 miles per hour. Tornadoes develop quickly and without warning in small areas of a squall line as it moves. Nimbus 4, get yours before the storm.